West Virginia is a special place. People of the state that have great pride in this WB logo. And you'll stop in the Golden Blue. It is a great night to be a Mountaineer wherever you may be. And now it's the show brought to you by Mountaineer fans for Mountaineer fans. The Country Roads Webcast. What's going on Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into the CRW podcast here for season six, episode 166. And we're here to talk about a backyard brawl victory in our backyard brawl review and reaction episode here. West Virginia comes out on top in the 106th backyard brawl. We talked a lot about the magnitude of this game and what it meant for West Virginia football for Neil Brown for this fan base. And West Virginia gets their first win over Pittsburgh since November 25th, 2011, and how sweet it was in an amazing atmosphere guys let's lead it off and talk about that first of all let me introduce you guys i guess i should do that probably but always you guys know them anyways they need no introduction they're such great co-hosts here for us among the crw community but i've got steven with me what's going on everybody and bradley what up now that we've got that out of the way, I was too excited about this backer brawl victory, as I'm sure everyone is. Why don't you guys give me your thoughts on the amazing atmosphere that we saw up there in Morgantown? I know we put a lot of talk into it matching 2011 LSU. I'll just say personally, I thought there was a lot of moments that it certainly did hit that. Really a lot of high highs in that game, especially when you get the outcome that you wanted. The crowd was fully engaged start to finish. Shout out to the students. They showed up and they stayed, and it was just electric atmosphere. You could feel it in the air from the time you touched down to Morgantown to the very last snap of the game when we were singing Country Roads. But want to hear your all's thoughts, first of all, on the atmosphere. Then we'll get into some of the nitty-gritty on the game and talk some numbers and stuff like that. But, uh, Stephen, what were your thoughts there on the atmosphere in Morgantown? Yeah, absolutely electric. Um, I have not felt the stadium be quite like that in in a long time. Um, as as far as it matching uh, 2011 LSU, I do I, I agree with you. I think there was moments where it absolutely matched it. Um, but I don't I don't know if it was because I was younger then, or 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 if we were you know had a, a little bit better of of a team at that time. I still think the LSU game had a little bit more energy. Um, but with that being said, I think that um, that atmosphere, if if it doesn't prove anything else, I think that it proves why rivalry games are still important in college football um, because you have two teams that otherwise, you know, w- I mean, with all due respect, it w- wouldn't be relevant right now, you know, in the world of college football playing. And, and you know, it was one of the primetime matchups in all of college football Saturday night. And I would be willing to bet that it was one of the best atmospheres in all of college football Saturday night, too. I'd agree with you 100%. This rivalry needs to continue to be played. I think these two competitive football games have shown that. Had a good atmosphere in Pittsburgh. Had one that even topped it in Morgantown, certainly in my opinion. Thought that it was electric. But, Brad, what did you think about the atmosphere there in Morgantown? Dude, I, I'm not going to lie. I thought it was a bit funky. I To me <clears> – <throat> I think the atmosphere was electric, but that was not the funnest game to watch. You know, really high highs, but like, right. man, oof, you know what I mean? And if anything, I sat back and I had this feeling of like the fan base was just hungry. They're just so hungry. And it's like, I was just like, it's like, I was just like waiting for that moment where we would just like have this like massive play and just like really 
flip the switch, you know what I mean? And just start dominating, you know what I mean? And we were just wanting that so bad and it didn't really happen. Like we pulled away, we were a better team and the fan base still just like stayed there and was like, yes, this is what we want to see. Like when, whether we've said it for the past two years that we didn't trust it anymore or not, we want to trust it. We want to believe. And it's like, we stay there to see it through. And it's like, looking forward to next week. Let's take that next step. Let's flip that switch. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's when it really begins. Conference play begins and we'll see what happens there. But I agree with you. I even mentioned that in the car ride home when we were talking about the atmosphere a little bit. And, you know, like I said, it was hundred percent electric. It was everything I wanted it to be. And then some, uh, but as far as, like I said, it matched, you know, that LSU game in moments, but I think overall, that's where it was lacking a little bit it was just because of the game itself, just the style of game that was being played. It wasn't, you know, a high scoring shootout, you know, like last year's game kind of was had shades of that. This year was certainly just a defensive slugfest, really ugly game. You know, that's one thing they talked about was us showing that we could win ugly in this game. And so that didn't lead to as much excitement overall, but I thought, you know, crowd engagement was awesome throughout though. Yeah. Which I was going to say, who would have, ever guessed that it would have been a defensive battle going into this game would you have ever imagined i thought it would be low scoring but i thought it would be like a race to 20 points maybe but no one even got there (laughs) yeah Yeah. i mean absolutely i don't know if you would have told me that we would have held um held them without a touchdown uh, if i looked at you and i said we only had what was it 221 Yards uh, I think 211, I believe. And six, 211. Six, if I looked at you and I said, hey, if I was like, listen, guys, Garrett Green's going to go out five plays in. We're only going to get 211 yard, uh, 11 yards and only score 17 points. You would not think we won that game. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah, it was uh, certainly a, a weird game. And I like the way you put it, Brad. It was funky in a lot of ways. But, you know, there's some things you can look at it on one side and you could say, I don't know if our offense has the horses to compete with, you know, in a shootout, which, as Brad said, we're going to find that out here shortly, probably in short order. So you can look at it that way. But, you know, I think a lot of people, myself included, are really just coming away impressed by the defense completely, you know, turning it around and quieting the naysayers for at least a week. So, I mean, I I think we got to start there, guys. What were your thoughts on this West Virginia defensive performance? You know, just because for me – I think we've talked a lot about the offensive line and rightfully so how good they're going to be. And they've shown that this season, but the defensive line is the unheralded story of the season so far. They're absolutely outstanding and West Virginia being good in the trenches is a good sign because if you're good in the trenches, you've got a chance to be a good football team. And I feel West Virginia does have that chance. So I definitely love the defensive line play. The linebackers we've talked about, Coba and Lathan continue to be outstanding, but the story in this game is obviously the secondary they talked about making some changes in coverage. I think those showed up. You saw guys pressing up when it was, you know, third and five versus being far off the receivers. Malachi Ruffin and Beanie Bishop played all of the snaps at cornerback. Uh, no one else came in there. It was just those two going the whole distance. Liked what I saw from both those guys. Both those guys got an interception. Then, of course, Aubrey Burks getting into the mix. West Virginia with three interceptions in this game. They had four all of last season. They've already surpassed that. Five interceptions total this season. They're top ten in the country right now in turnovers forced. So I think, you know, that's one thing I mentioned in the lead up to this game is if West Virginia is going to be a bend but break, don't break defense, you know, that has some – deficiencies in some areas specifically in the secondary a way to make up for that is being opportunistic and West Virginia has showed in this game that they can be and that was against power five competition so that's what I came away with probably impressed most by in this game um, in addition to some other things but what were your all's thoughts on the defensive play in this game uh, what are you thinking Steven um, I, overall impressed uh, you know I think there'd be you know there's a lot of people that are attributing you know how good of our performance was to how bad their quarterback was Djokovic um which you know a lot of it can be attributed to how bad he is because because he's a joke of a bitch. he's trash uh, yeah he's <laughs> he's not very good um but anyway I, I a lot of what I even seen last week against Duquesne um I seen flipped in in this game on Saturday night I think you know I didn't see nearly as many um, opportunities for receivers um, for Pitt as I did for Duquesne or Penn State. Um, I like that Aubrey Burks kind of kind of had the what I call a bounce back game. 
uh, after giving up that big play at Penn State up there and had him a nice little uh, interception and almost had him a pick six. Uh, and I, and that's one thing about it, too. I think, uh, you know, these kind of performances only feed um, going into the later weeks and, and especially going into conference play here in, this week against Texas Tech. Um, it seems like, you know, from the way Beanie Bishop sounded in his pref- press conference, I don't know if you guys watched that one, it, it's like more of that now they got like this friendly competition on like, you know, because Beanie was like, all right, you, you got one. Now I got to go get me one. And he was like, I'm going to take mine to the house, though. And, you know, he didn't He didn't end up taking it back. But it's just that kind of like that attitude and that, you know, those kinds of things that, that kids on the defense are going to feed off of on each other. And, and I'm like you. I think our interior defense up, up front, we're stout, man. Like, for what? I think either Frank Signetti Jr. is the dumbest play caller I've ever seen in my life accumulated with the worst quarterback I've ever seen in my life. Um, because if I'm a play caller going against West Virginia, you know, after what I've seen in the first two weeks, I'm going to throw it all night. And I think I, it was probably 85%, 90% run for the pit offense, and we just shut them down all night long. Uh, so – I will definitely commend them for doing a good job there. West Virginia really showed up on defense. Yeah, that they did. I I 100% agree. It was a game where, you know, one team was going to impose their will on the other, and uh, West Virginia's defense didn't let the Pitt offense do it, aside from Pitt's first drive. Pitt on that opening drive ran for 67 yards on 10 carries. Following that, for the remainder of the game, they only ran for 63 yards total after that first drive in which they ran for 67. So West Virginia's defense really bowed up. Um, like I said, that defensive line and linebacking core, really good, I think. And the secondary showed improvements. Hopefully that continues. Going to be tested moving forward. But, Bradley, what were your thoughts on the West Virginia defense in the backyard brawl? Yeah, I think that there was a couple of really bright, shining people in that game. And I think that Stephen mentioned one of them and Beanie Bishop. And I would say that arguably to me, the most impressive person on our defense so far, maybe not the most impressive, but the one that's caught my eye the most has been Trey Lathan. The guy has been playing absolute dynamite at linebacker right now. I, yeah, I remember yeah. I went into this game and I was like, I just want to watch when I rewatched the game. I was like, I just want to watch Trey Lathan because I feel like he did a great job. You know what I mean? And the PFF grades hadn't come out yet. And I was like, I want to see, I want to watch Trey Lathan because like I'm hearing great things. I felt like he was all over the place. I just want to watch him. And the way he plays is electric. Like, that man is on top of it. And he's so young still. And you can tell he's growing every single day. And, you know, I I think I think he's definitely on pace. I'm going to call it now. He's going to be a freshman All-American, guaranteed. Like, I, I just – you can already tell that he knows what he's doing. And I think just, like, the more, more he learns, the more impressive he's going to be. And I think that – um, he's really going to put his stamp on this season as a freshman. Yeah, he's well on his way. Another player that I wanted to mention on our defense that's really been catching my eye this year is for Torma Moba. Yes. I think that that kid has been – Him and Tony George Iowa, both those two big transfers have made an impact. You want to talk about transfers? And and yeah. both of them make an impact in minimal snaps too. They're both playing, you know, under 20 snaps a game, you know, so far each and – both have made big impacts. Mulba's really been stuffing the run, especially in short yardage situation. And Durge's been making an impact in pass rush. And then look out, because here comes Asani Redwood. He played 15 snaps in this game, and they're re- they're really talking him up, according to the broadcasters. When I rewatched it, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and like he's going to get there one day. He, he's just for if people don't remember, that guy had 20 sacks in his senior year of high school, or it, maybe I think he had 17 his senior year. Five is junior year. Either way, it was a ridiculous amount. In Georgia. Playing in Georgia. The guy's for real. He is. He is. So look out for him. Low level high school football, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) He's gone through an injury. He's changing a lot, you know, been through a lot, but I'm sure he's ready to get out there and prove himself. Yeah. And I think West Virginia's shown they have a deep defensive line. You know, they may have lost some high level players, but they have a lot of really good players on this defensive line. I think you're talking three deep at each position, defensive end, defensive tackle, and nose tackle at least. And you can probably throw a couple other in there to where West Virginia may legit have 10 to 12 guys they can rotate in on that defensive line. The only issue comes when you play a team like you're going to play against Texas Tech coming up. And, of course, we'll talk more about this later in the week in the Texas Tech preview that can go no huddle and force you to not be able to get some of those subs in and can wear down that defensive line a little bit. But 
Uh, like I said, we'll talk about that more when we come to it. But all in all, it looks like West Virginia's defense well on its way to being more improved. Hopefully the secondary continues to play the way it did, be opportunistic and force turnovers, and West Virginia can add that to their arsenal and be a team that leads the uh, conference in turnovers. And if so, that can be really good for them because it looks like they're going to be strong in the trenches. Talked a little bit about that defensive line. Let's flip it over. Let's talk about the West Virginia offense. And for me, you got to start there with the offensive line. We talked a lot about through the offseason about how good this West Virginia offensive line can be. I said I thought it could be the best since 2016. I think they're certainly showing that, and who knows how good that they can be. The sky's the limit for them. Our five starters go the whole distance in this game. Nick Malone is the other, only other offensive lineman that gets snaps, but when he was in there, it was in addition to those linemen, just kind of lining up almost like a tight end in his 10 snaps. And our offensive line, I was just really impressed because it was one of those games where you're running the football when they know you're going to run it, and we were still able to get some movement and still able to make some plays. And um, it's just going to be our kind of style. I know some people think it's boring to watch or whatever, but as long as we end up with, you know, check marks in the win column, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with playing, you know, old school ground and pound football, play good defense, control the clock, and and do this thing if that's what we're going to do. Obviously, I'm hoping down the line we'll throw in some more play action, some more stuff for Nico if Nico's going to be the guy. And we're going to have to pass the ball a little bit more probably than what we did in this game. But just for this style of game, this slobber knocker backyard brawl, I loved what I saw from the West Virginia offense, specifically the offensive line and the tight ends blocking up front in this physical battle. Uh, but what did you think, Brad, about this West Virginia offense? Yeah, I mean, I thought we did what we needed to do. I think that C.J. Donaldson really, you know, did what we expected him to do. The offensive line had great blocking. You know, they were all really impressive up front. Um, and, you know, like you said, if, if we got to be somebody that's going to knock you down, drag you out, we're going to do it then. You know what I mean? Like that's at this point, I don't care what it takes to win. I really don't just win baby. Yeah. I'll take 211 yards all day. That was the most, that was not a very fun game to watch, but I would watch it every time if I got a W at the end of it. Exactly. I even enjoyed rewatching it. So hundred percent. I'm right there with you on that one. Uh, Steven, what do you got to add uh, in, in regards to West Virginia offense? Uh, well, first of all, you know, I, I, offensive line absolutely needs to be commended for, for their performance. Um, and I do think that we're going to be able to run the ball well going forward. But, I mean, how about Nico, man? How about Nico coming into yeah, – still we got to talk about it. Yeah, coming into the situation that he came into and and doing what he needed to do to get it done. You know what I mean? He did – he made some great throws. I mean, there were some throws that, you know, were a little bit shaky. But overall, I think that he uh, – I think he did a great job of uh, taking advantage of the moment and really, you know, coming out and – doing what he's going to he showed for one thing for sure for me that he's going to be the guy of the future i mean for people that didn't already know that but i mean I, and i'm going to go ahead and ask it is is he the guy of the now uh, i was going to get to that brad okay so before before you got a chance to ask me i'm going to ask you guys because i already had a plan if all right so gg is out for two weeks two to three weeks if nico goes three and oh is he your new starting quarterback? You don't pull him. Thank you. Yeah, you – yeah. Thank you. I, I absolutely agree. And this is coming from somebody who's wanted Garrett Green behind center for the last two years. And I think you can mix in some packages for Garrett Green when he's healthy, if you'd like even. But I am even was in the camp after, you know, this backyard brawl win that roll with Nico now. He's got he, – he looks good. There was just a sense of something about the team, and it's not – yeah, like I said, you can't look at it on a stat sheet. You can't – I don't know what it is, but when you were there watching the game, and I'm sure watching it on TV it was the same because it felt the same to me when I was re-watching it. It's just something that's intangible, a feeling that he just has like a sense of control over the offense that uh, it just feels like things felt more in hand with Nico in there despite the fact that GG's the more veteran player. And that's not a knock on Garrett Green. I think it's just something that Nico has. When I would even say, because I put some thought on it too, and I was like, you know, trying to find like a little silver lining thing. Is it making the offense better because we were, it's the eyes are off the quarterback now. You know what I mean? Like everybody's still focusing to see how Garrett Green's going to do. And, you know, is Nico Markill going to be better than Garrett Green? Do we have the right guy at quarterback and like giving him his chance, you know, doing wishy washy stuff? That's out the window now. 
it's Nico Marchio. You know what I mean? And so that puts a focus on guys like CJ Donaldson and the offensive line and be like, hey, you're it now. You know what I mean? Like you've got to step it up. You've got to be better. You've got to do this. And they always talk about, you know, the best quarterback is the one that makes the rest of his team better, you know? And if it's that little silver lining that, you know, now the focus has shifted and we know who's going to have to step up, maybe those guys are stepping up because CJ Donaldson really impressed me. I mean, he was out Absolutely. there when, when Nico Marco you fumbled the football and the you know, first person right there at him was like CJ Donaldson picked him up. He said, Hey, you can literally see him like, you know, something. he's like, Hey, forget about that. We got, we got to go. And then next play you're back out there and you score a touchdown. You know what I mean? I did notice that what you're saying. Cause I thought that was awesome. Like leadership and just being a great teammate from CJ. Cause literally after the play, he comes, he puts his arm around Nico. And then if you look, he, if you watch, he physically like Nico starts to drop his head and CJ takes his hand and lifts his chin up with his, and with his own, with CJ's hand. And I was like, that's awesome, dude. And that's like, that's it right there. I yeah. got me emotional. just thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you want to know what I want to see guys? So first of all, I want to say if they do name Nico, the starter, even beyond, you know, when Garrett can come back. I think there will be nobody happier for Nico than Garrett Green. Oh, yeah. Did you see that embrace after the game? Yeah, yeah, I did. I think that them two have a really close relationship, and and that's why I think that Nico is going to be the great player that he's going to be for West Virginia. Uh, but what I would love to see is if that happens, I, I think Garrett Green would be a great slot receiver. With the speed, with I mean, he's he's probably got good hands because most of the time quarterbacks switch into that position have great hands. David Seals, Charles Hales, I mean, you, I can name you a lot of them. I think he wants to be a quarterback. I think so too, but I think that like he just doesn't. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not hating on the kid at all, but I just don't think he has the size. He's gotten hurt three in three straight games. Yeah, he's and the thing is also you know. Is great deep ball. We talked about that. It's awesome. I still want to continue to say that. But short to intermediate, I think he struggles because you look at the height of our offensive line, 6'7", six, 6'7", seven, six, seven on the tackles, 6'6", six, 6'6", six, six, six on the guards, and then Frazier, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and Gigi's back there 5'10". You know, it's I think he struggles to see on some of those intermediate routes and also maybe why he missed some of those throws up over the middle that he didn't see there. So uh, I think Nico gives you a little bit better advantage point there as well with his you know more prototypical height for a quarterback and like i said not to knock on garrett but also we haven't seen nico yet with the full chance to prepare i mean just thinking about nico he's been able to win against oklahoma state a team that west virginia you know had struggled to beat played the majority of that game last season late last year as a as a true freshman and then here this year as a redshirt freshman thrust into action in the most important game of Neil Brown's coaching career, one of the most important West Virginia football games in a while, one of the best and wildest atmospheres in a long time, thrust into action there with next to no practice reps and finds a way to get it win there. So that's impressive what he's done thus far. And now he's getting a chance to prepare like he's the starter. So I think we've seen good things from Nico. And like I said, we've seen that intangible just thing of him leading the offense and being able to find a way to win, and I think that's one thing you can say about Nico so far in college and, of course, throughout his amazing high school career was that he's a winner, and I think hopefully he's going to continue to find ways for West Virginia to win, but I'm excited to see what he looks like with a full time to actually prepare as a starter for a week this week potentially. Yeah, at one point in time I definitely said, hey, throw up on it if you need to. <laughs> hey, he's done it before, right? Yeah, he only threw the ball nine times on Saturday night, though. So, so we really haven't gotten a full sample size of. Did what I hear from somewhere year. though that he went for six for six on the back end? I think that he's. I think he started zero for two or zero for three. So he had a really good uh, comp completion percentage to end the game. Yeah. Nice. But the one thing, of course, with the offense, ton of positives to take away from this game, especially run game wise and things like that. That I think we've talked about. The passing game, like you guys are talking about, I don't know if it's necessarily a concern. I think you have pieces there, and we'll continue to see that side develop. I think the concern is lack of explosiveness. You still need to have to get some explosive plays in there. Like I said, with this game, being a slobber knocker didn't end up mattering you know, in the end, but you didn't have any 20-yard plays in this game. I think your longest run was like 15 yards, and your longest pass was 17 yards. So I think moving forward, if West Virginia can you know, be consistent like they were in the short yardage when they need to be run when they when the defense knows it's coming and still get there like they did in this game and be physical like they were but you need to mix that in with a few explosive plays here and there a handful of explosive plays and then you really be talking uh with this West Virginia offense I think yeah that's that's my biggest gripe with it is we lack the 
the ability of getting an explosive play every now and then. But having said that, there has been some, you know, different play designs and things that I have liked this season. And personally, I'm crediting some of that to Chad Scott and his involvement. I did want to mention some of those. I had, you know, jotted down a couple of notes earlier. Uh, but the one play design I wanted to mention was on a third and six uh, when Nico's in the game. I got it down here. Yeah, it was split back set. Uh, Jalen Anderson and Jaheim White were the two backs. Uh, Jalen Anderson was offset to Nico's right. Jaheim White offset to the left. Uh, so you got 20 personnel in there. And they sent Jaheim White out uh, behind Nico out, you know, kind of in like orbit motion. And it's almost a triple uh, or an RPO slash triple option look, I guess you could call it, because it's a read option then with Jalen Anderson. He's reading the defensive end. But then he's also got Jaheim White on that orbit motion. He could have, you know, potentially thrown a little swing pass to there. So I really like the design of that play. And on third and six, it worked great uh, because the defense – Red Jaheim White, someone went with him, and then they crashed hard on the Jalen Anderson fake, and Nico was able to scramble for 10 to 12 yards there and pick up the first down on third and six. So that was a set that I really liked with the two backs and a play design that I really liked in this game that I wanted to mention. And I think, you know, moving forward, you could see more of that with Nico. Like I said, with a whole week to game plan, you could see some different things. And uh, that's something I wanted to mention was that, you know, because I want to talk some positives about the offense, but. I also – that really brings to mind something else I wanted to bring up, and that's giving kudos to this coaching staff and Neil Brown because one thing that we talked about that we hadn't seen from him is something that we had hoped to see when he was hired, and that was, you know, being like a – I kind of compared it, compared it to the Bill Snyder-type Kansas State teams, teams that don't beat themselves. You don't Discipline. get a lot of penalties. You win the turnover ba battle. You're really disciplined. Yes, exactly. I thought that that's what we'd always see from a Neil Brown team. And, you know, knock on wood, but right here this year, I think we've, we're starting to see it. Yeah, so far through these first three games, small sample size, like I said, knock on wood, but we haven't been very penalized. We've been doing a great job in that, way better than years before. Been doing better in the turnover battle. And then I think in this game, in this backyard brawl win, you saw them do something else that we have complained about you know, being an issue in the past, and that's in-game adjustments. I think he did a great job, especially once Garrett went down and he talked about it after the game. His playbook went from a notebook down to half a sheet of paper, but he found out things that would both work and that Nico liked. So I wanted to definitely give flowers and shout out to the, this coaching staff. They've been receiving a lot of negative criticism past, you know, year and a half or so. So in this game, when they get a very important win and they really did some things that impressed me, I wanted to shout out Neil Brown and his staff for in-game adjustments, their preparation, just everything in this game. I thought it was well-coached all around. So I wanted to shout that out as well. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It was, a uh, you know, kind of a microcosm of things that Neil Brown has talked about, and we actually got to see them come to fruition in this game because the other sequence that I had jotted down uh, was a perfect example of complementary football and that's something that Neil Brown's always talked about as complementary in team football and to me there was a sequence in the second quarter that really exemplified that because you got a West Virginia drive that ends and so then Oliver Straw gets an excellent punt and you get good coverage by Malachi Ruff and down it inside the one yard line so there's special teams complementing your offense then your defense follows that up by forcing a three and out to flip the field, get the ball back to the offense, the defense complementing that good special teams there, which then Nico gets two good completions on that drive, which ends with the red zone fumble that we talked about. But then two plays later, you get the Burks interception with the long return, sets up the offense who scores on the next play on the RPO pass to Cole Taylor. Just complimentary football all around from special teams to defense to offense and back again, ending up with the you know lone touchdown that would have won this game by itself right there. West Virginia could have won seven to six with that lone sequence of complimentary football right there. So that's something that Neil Brown's talked about, and I think you saw it right there in a nutshell and why it can be so big for a team like West Virginia. Hot damn, Cruz, you keep talking about things like that. You're going to have me trusting the client, brother. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to get everybody uh, sipping that Kool-Aid. Call me uh, Jim Jones for the Neil Brown Chester Klein movement. That's that's some convincing. That's good. Yeah, that makes us, that makes us sound like a, you know a halfway decent football team almost. Hey, we got a chance. We got a chance, man. Uh, but speaking of that, uh, we're going to get into some numbers in regards to this game and see what they look like and how that makes us feel about this performance more so. But now that we've given some of our takeaways, before we get into those numbers, I did want to share uh, one other thing, gentlemen. That that I know we love to discuss, and that's uniforms. And how about West Virginia coming away ranked number one 
uniform of the week for week three with the home version of the Country Roads Trust uh, uniform there. Uh, number one uh, from Uniform Authority. So that leads me to ask you guys uh, your thoughts on the home version of the Country Roads Trust uniforms now that you got to see them live and in person. Uh, what do you think, Stephen? Hey, man, uh, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, I absolutely love these. I, I think I told you earlier, I, I don't know if I'd choose them as our primaries because I I think that they they make a really good alternate jersey. I, I love them too. I love the stripes on the helmet. I don't know if I'd want the stripes all the time, but I would love having it as an option, you know, for an alternate, like you said. However, I would love having stripes on the pants all the time, even if it's just, even if it's not that double stripe and just a single stripe. I'm a big fan of that, proponent of that. But all in all, I loved them. They looked great. I love that West Virginia state silhouette with the WV inside. I think we should utilize that logo more and across more uniforms personally. But, Brad, what do you think? Yeah, no, I'm in love with them. I love the double stripe. I, I'm a huge fan of the double stripe. Like the actual road look, I think that it's just, I don't know. I, I think it's identity building. I think it's, <clears throat> I don't know. It just catches my eye, and I'm a big fan of it. So, yeah, I thought these were spicy. Agreed, as did a lot of social media platforms, West Virginia was ranked one or two across most of them. You see their uniform authority ranking them one. And then Uni Swag ranking the Mountaineers number two there. You see another picture of the jerseys there. That one coming on Aubrey Burke's return. But wanted to uh, cover those a little bit as West Virginia got a chance to debut the home version of the Country Road uniforms. But be sure to let us know your all's thoughts down in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, whether you're tuned in on the Country Roads webcast YouTube or the WV Sports channel, as you can find us on the web at wvsportsnow.com, where you'll find all kinds of great Mountaineer content. And either one of those video versions you're tuned into, we'll ask that you please hit the like button. Give us a thumbs up on this video. It really helps its performance and future videos' performances. And if you're a West Virginia fan, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Helps us, helps you, helps get more of this Mountaineer sports content out to Mountaineer Nation, but we appreciate you if you're listening to the episode on the audio side as well, what you can find on any podcast platform you like, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, you name it. Just search for Country Roads Webcast. Share us around with other Mountaineer fans you may know and leave us a rating and review. That helps us out as well. Having said that and having discussed some jerseys and given our thoughts on the game, let's take a look at the numbers and provide some uh, thoughts on the stats from this game as well, gentlemen. All right, let's lead it off here with the team stats. As you can see in the scoring summary, West Virginia really dominated this game after the first quarter, outscoring Pitt 17-3 to from that point to end up with our final score of 17-6, to of course, moving West Virginia to 2-1 and overall in the 2023 season. First downs, West Virginia outgains Pitt 14-12. to Third down efficiency, very close, 4 of 13 for Pitt, 4 of 12 for West Virginia. Fourth downs, West Virginia held Pitt to 0 of 2 on fourth down conversions, very big there, almost like two more turnovers. West Virginia 1 of 3 themselves on fourth downs. Total yards completely even, one of the lowest total yardage you'll see there across both teams, 211 each. Passing yardage, neither team hitting 100 passing yards, so really looking like an old-school stat line here. 81 passing yards for Pitt versus 60 for West Virginia, but the Mountaineers only attempted 11 passes. Pitt threw the ball 20 times. Pitt threw three interceptions, West Virginia with zero. Rushing the football, West Virginia managed to run for over 150 yards on the Panthers, totaling 151 on the night versus 134 Pitt. But like I said, 67 of those coming on their first drive. So West Virginia doing a great job following that. Uh, penalties, we talked about West Virginia doing a better job in that area this season. That continued in this game, only being penalized four times, and where Pitt was penalized nine times. West Virginia winning the turnover battle there, plus two three uh, turnovers for the Panthers versus only one for the Mountaineers. And West Virginia outpossesses Pitt 33-26 to 26 in time of possession minutes there as well. Um, any thoughts here on the team stats, uh, gentlemen? What are you thinking there, Stephen? Anything you want to toss in there? Yeah, like you said, super old school stat line, man. It's uh, I can't remember the last time neither team in a football game didn't go for over 100 passing yards, so that's a little weird, you know? <laughs> Yeah, very, very interesting uh, for sure. Uh, Brad, what about you? Anything you got on team stats? Yeah, I got two little little fun ones. Uh, the first one is going to be time of possession. I remember at the halftime, we were actually down in time of possession. And going back to what you were saying about coaches making changes and like doing things that have not really been there for to you, I think that's one of those things, like those halftime changes to be like, hey, we need to possess the ball more. Like we got to 
sure things up. I think that's also another metric where you can sit there and point to it a little bit. And then I saw one the other day, or um, one that I wanted to bring up was that Pitt's punter averaged. Do you guys, any one of you know what he averaged per punt over his four punts? No, I didn't see this. 51 yards. Wow. Dude was absolutely stroking them balls. Definitely. Definitely. That's impressive. <laughs> Very impressive. Yeah, I not that that really brings anything to this context, but just that's a crazy statistic that I had to bring up. No, and I like I like your point there on the time of possession as well. I think it goes right hand in hand there with the coaches making adjustments. But you know, then to go back to what Steven said, the standout to me looking at this is I don't know. I wanted to research it and go back and see if I could find it, but just didn't have the time or you know wanted to put the, forth the effort. I guess you could say, but. uh 51 rush attempts versus 11 passes for West Virginia. Got to go way, way back since the last time they ran it 40 more times than they passed it. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at the individual stats for the Mountaineers in this one now as well. See how they came up with some of those team numbers. Passing-wise, we know Nico was the guy following Garrett Green's early exit after that first drive for the Mountaineers. Talked about him really improving his completion percentage later in the game, started 0 of 2 or 0 of 3, and was really hot from then on. And when he did get a chance to throw the ball, which a couple of times he really threw some darts on RPO passes over the middle, uh, which he pulled the, out of the mesh read and uh, hit some end cut routes, one to Hudson Clement and uh, one to Devin Carter that really stuck out to me. Finished 6 of 9 for 60 yards and a touchdown. Uh, rushing statistics, of course, this is where the Mountaineers really leaned on the offensive line, leaned on their run game and their workhorse. C.J. Donaldson, 18 carries, 102 yards and a touchdown. Two backyard brawl appearances for C.J. Donaldson, two 100-yard plus rushing games. Jalen Anderson, 19 carries, 62 yards. Thought he played really well in this game also. Garrett Green, one carry, one yard. Unfortunately, I believe that was where the injury occurred for Garrett. Um, then you get Rodney Gallagher, also one carry, one yard. Uh, Nico's uh, had a couple rushing attempts that did net positive yardage, but with the sacks, uh, nine carries, negative five, unfortunately, is the ultimate outcome. Uh, Receiving-wise, Cole Taylor led the Mountaineers in receptions and in yards and was the only touchdown scorer for the Mountaineers. As a receiver there, I thought he really was impressive in some of the things he did in the way West Virginia used him. I think his role is going to continue to grow. Three catches, 21 yards, and a touchdown. A catch apiece for Devin Carter and Preston Fox. And then uh, Hudson Clement added another one for 10 yards there. So what are your all's thoughts on the West Virginia individual stats? Uh, Brad, anything stand out there to you? No, I am not say if anything that what's coming to me is just thinking about you know, our wide receivers and their catching stats and just thinking about how important every single one of those catches was because there's just a few of them. That's true. Great point. I mean, yeah, look at it. It's one for 10, one for 14, one for 15, and three for 21. And then you add the touchdown to that. And I thought Cole Taylor was the most impressive one we've seen all night. I love the utilization of the tight end. Well, and it's it's the guys that you were counting on because it's your three starting receivers and your starting tight end, you're your only pass catchers on the night. So at least it's the guys that you thought you could count on you were able to when you needed to. Rude up. Anybody got anything else here offensive statistics-wise individually? Um, I will admit that Jalen Anderson is looking really good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I think both – you know, everybody talks about CJ, but I, I think you're right about that. I think Jalen does a great job of feeling – I don't want to even call it a backup role, but, you know, calling that – Filling that co-star role. Yeah, he, he he does have good he does have a good good ability, and I almost would call them co-starters. And uh, he had, he had one in this game where um, he read it right, he hit the hole right, but the wide receiver, if he'd have held his block just half a second longer, probably would have been a long touchdown run. We've seen him break those late last season. I think he's going to do it again here, hopefully sooner rather than later uh, for Jalen. But um, definitely, definitely like what I see from him. Jordan's trying to make Jalen Anderson co-starting happen now. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm slightly sliding him up the depth chart now and saying it, it listed him as a co-starter but he was in I mean on the, the if I'm not mistaken the very first play of scrimmage from for West Virginia CJ was in the backfield but Jalen was split out in the slot and came in motion took a jet sweep handoff with Garrett Green under center so technically they were co-starters for this game so I can I can, I can push that officially now 
<laughs> but uh, that's what we got offensive individual stats. Let's flip it over to the other side. Look at the defensive numbers for West Virginia. We talked about the standout front seven, how great they've been this year, the improvement from the secondary in this game. Let's see how the numbers reflect that. Uh, Trey Lathan, eight total tackles and half of a tackle for a loss. Anthony Wilson, seven total tackles from his safety position. Beanie Bishop, seven tackles. And, of course, the interception. Lee Koba continues to be a standout for the Mountaineers. Seven tackles for him. So, between your two linebackers, Lee Koba and Trey Lathan, 15 tackles there. That's awesome. Jared Bartlett, I thought, played really well at the bandit position. Five tackles for him. We talked about for Torma Mulba, one tackle for a loss and five tackles. Half a tackle for a loss for Hershey McLaurin and to go with five tackles. Mike Lockhart, one and a half tackles for a loss, one of those being – a blown up play on third and one that he ended up uh, forcing a three yard TFL. Talked a bit about Tommy. He had three tackles in this game. Tyron Bradley splitting time with uh, Jared Bartlett at that band of position, had a sack and a TFL. Aubrey Burks with half of a TFL. And then, of course, we mentioned the interception from Beanie Bishop and Aubrey Burks, both with great returns. And then Malachi Ruffin with probably the most athletic play of the night, arguably, with the interception that he made off the tipped ball from Marcus Floyd, going around the defender, batting it to himself, and impressively coming down with it before he hit the ground and the ball hit the ground. So West Virginia's two starting corners, and they're starting free safety coming up with picks in this game. But what are y'all's thoughts on the individual stats? Anything stand out to you on that side, Stephen? Beanie continues to do work, Lee. Uh, Koba continues to do work. You know, I, I think it jumps out to me that most of the ones in our top half on the tackle sheet, at least, is uh, is secondary players. You know, and I think that's to be commended, especially with considering how much Pitt ran the ball. Especially also, you know, when you take into account how much we struggled with tackling last season, seems like it's been corrected. It seems like a lot of things that we struggled with are areas that they emphasized on and have improved on to this point, I think. So I, I certainly agree there. Good tackling coming from the back half of that defense for West Virginia. Brad, uh, these defensive statistics, anything stand out and catch your eye there? No, but I did want to shout out Malachi Ruffin and just the consistent improvement he's had. It's, it's just been – he's been a fun one to watch for a really long time. You know, he went from kind of lame duck out there on an island status to, you know, really being a pretty good defender. And it's it's been – um, I'm excited for that guy. Meteoric rise, you could almost call it. I mean, he's a guy that comes not even as a preferred walk-on for West Virginia. He's a guy that shows up at a tryout, you know, back in 2018, I believe it was, and, uh, you know, student in West Virginia, they have a tryout. He comes out super athletic, makes the team, and just works his way up from, you know, scout team to all the way to a contributor on special teams to a scholarship player to where he was playing safety a couple of years ago for West Virginia when they didn't have the bodies, moves the corner last season. West Virginia has to call on him when they have injuries there. He gets picked on initially, then starts to really become a player in that Oklahoma State win. He made big plays at the end of that game. And then this season, you know, you're wondering how much he's going to contribute. He gets beat out in camp by Andrew Wilson Lamp doesn't bat an eye when he's called upon after Wilson Lamp struggles, comes out as a starter in this backyard brawl, performs great, one of the top five highest grades on defense, according to PFF for the Mountaineers, and that impressive interception. So you love to see it, and just a heck of a story right there for Malachi Ruffin. So, yeah, great to point that out as well, Brad. Uh, but that's what we've got as far as our takeaways and a little bit of discussion of the numbers uh, from this game. But we'd love to hear your all thoughts in regards to this game. Drop your comments in regards to the backyard brawl down below or leave them in the rate review section if you are on the audio side there. But to wrap things up here on Season 6, Episode 166, guys, let's take a look at the scores from the rest of the Big 12 here. <laughs> All right, full Saturday slate of action for the Big 12, including our first conference game that we saw this week. But leading it off, Kansas State and Missouri. Interesting matchup there. Bit of a rivalry contest taking place at Missouri. And Missouri ultimately comes out on top 30-27 to 27 on a 61-yard field goal as time expired. Yeah, what a kick. Impressive, very impressive. You don't see that a lot in the college game. Um, ultimately, though, you know, it would set up what would lead to be kind of a – down week for the Big 12 as a few upsets occurred across the conference. 
for us Mountaineer fans, at least we were, you know, one of the lone bright spots and it was a happy week for us because the rest of the conference did not walk away as happy, including fans of the Iowa State Cyclones, as unfortunately they hit the road and lose to a group of five team that West Virginia will play here in a couple years as well. The Ohio Bobcats there in Athens, uh, 10 to 7, Ohio beat Iowa State. And I got to shout you out here, Brad. You actually picked this one in our preview show. So uh, you called it. I did, yeah. I, I remember um uh, shout out that the people that let me stay at their house over the weekend for the pit game. I had picked Ohio because that's where she went to school at and I told her that and she texted me in the middle of the game and was like, Ohio won and I was like, Hey there you go. I don't know why, but it just makes me think of uh Pulp Fiction. I don't know if you remember at the beginning with uh, John Travolta and Samuel Jackson, and they go in and they're talking to the guys, and Samuel Jackson says, check out the big brain on Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good stuff there. Good call. Ohio with the upset over the Cyclones. Moving on, Baylor bounces back, although maybe not handling Long Island with as large of a score margin as some may have seen coming uh, but they do walk away with the 30 to 7 victory over long island there at the home game in waco oklahoma continues to look much improved and rather impressive handling tulsa there in a road game at tulsa 66 to 17 the sooners come out on the winning end dylan gabriel looking very good for oklahoma thus far this season at the quarterback position and then ucf the new addition to the big 12 with a big win over villanova 48 to 14 in a home game there at the bounce house in orlando their offense continues to thrive they win this game despite uh the absence of John Reese Plumley at quarterback. The backup steps in and still gets the job done handily for the big victory. And then here we go, guys. The, probably the biggest upset of the week, especially just with the margin. And of the year so home. far. <laughs> Yeah, probably of the year. And uh, something that I've said here in the past is never bet against Gundy. And boy, did I eat crow on this one because South Alabama goes into Stillwater, handles the Cowboys 33 to 7. Unbelievable. Yikes. Yikes. Oklahoma State's been playing three quarterbacks this year, and I think it's safe to say uh, that old adage, you know, if you have multiple quarterbacks, you have none, is proven true with their performance in this game. And then, uh, of course, we got the Mountaineers' upcoming opponent, Texas Tech. They'll be coming into Morgantown this Saturday for the Gold Rush game. But this past week, they were back at home in Lubbock, taking on their FCS opponent, Tarleton State, and they handled them 41-3. Then you get another upset, and this time it's one of the Big 12 newcomers getting upset at home, and they were coming off a high beating Pittsburgh, the team that we just beat, and people were talking about how strong their defense looked. But then their defense turns around this week, gives up 31 points to Miami of Ohio, and loses an overtime at home, 31-24. to Cincinnati upset uh, by Miami of Ohio there. Next up, uh, we're continuing the theme of uh, – Big 12 newcomers, I guess, as BYU was up uh, heading to Arkansas to take on an SEC opponent. Um, I was expecting Arkansas to win this game, especially at home, but BYU continues to look pretty good this season, and they come out with a win. They've won some defensive games earlier in the season. This time, they showed they can win a game scored in the 30s as they defeat Arkansas 38-31 to there in Fayetteville. Good job, BYU. Quarterback still sucks. Slay was uh, trash. And then Texas, uh, coming off the big win against Alabama, comes back home. We're worried about a bit of a hangover, but they end up, you know, not having that hangover happen. Three-score win over Wyoming, 31-10 to for Texas as they continue to roll here in the 2023 season. And then Kansas, tough matchup with Nevada approved there for them to head out to the West Coast. They faced some challenges there, but ultimately they were able to score the game-winning touchdown late in that game, break the 24-all tie as they win 31-24 to over Nevada. And then our game of the week this week um, was the first Big 12 conference matchup of the season. So that's why we had it as the game of the week. And it was close for about, you know, two and a half quarters into the third quarter there. But then uh, TCU ultimately flexed their offensive muscles, uh, showed Houston that their defense will continue to struggle, it looks like, uh, this season as they enter the Big 12. And the Houston offense, surprisingly, struggled as well, was not able to keep up with the pace of TCU, losing at home 36-13 to as TCU takes down uh, the fighting Dana Holger, sends in what was our week three game of the week here on the CRW around the Big 12 segment. Yeah, so I did a little looky-do at Dana Holgerson's postgame. Uh-oh. After that loss to TCU. 
And tell me, tell me if this just sounds a little familiar. Um, Dana Holgerson was talking about his defense and um, he's like, you know, and everybody, he said this and I quote, and everybody's asking me, you know, why don't we have depth back there? And the truth of it is we just don't. Wow. That's what Dana Holgerson said. And whose fault is that, Dana? Why, why don't you have depth back there, Dana? Is there some <laughs> fundamental just, thing? Don't. Is there one fun, some fundamental thing that you just suck at doing? Listen, I know, I know it's far, far down the line, and I'm getting ahead of myself because who knows what could happen when that game comes around and buy it, and this may come back to bite me in the ass. But it's going to be so sweet to see West Virginia beat Dana Holgerson with a lot of West Virginia kids starting on the roster, specifically on the offensive side, Hudson Clement, Wyatt Milam, Doug Nestor, Zach Frazier, go down the line when Dana Holgerson said, you know, we weren't going to win at West Virginia. We weren't going to get the type of talent from West Virginia kids. He wouldn't recruit the West Virginia kids either. So that's just going to be freaking sweet, man. I just have to say that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I absolutely agree. Not, not hiding our feelings about Dana at all as we, uh, you know, are one to do. We've talked about him a time or two. I'm sure we'll have plenty of discussions between now and uh, when that game happens on in October there on that Thursday. You know, hopefully we get to beat Dana Holgerson, right? Got to. Got to. And, uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we get to beat Dana Holgerson. You know what I mean? Oh, I see what you're getting at. I see what you're getting at. He's uh, His seat's turned up a little bit to where, as well. The temperature's rising. True that. Having said that, gentlemen, we've provided our takeaways. We've went through the numbers a little bit. We've even talked a little about the scores around the Big 12. But one last thing to do here before we close this out, I'm going to share on the screen the players of the week that West Virginia announced from their side. And of course I'll call them out for you guys that are listening on the audio side and not tuned into the video version. But while I do that, uh, you guys be thinking of your player of the game for this one. We'll each provide our player of the game here uh, before we close out episode 166 here of the CRW podcast, our backyard brawl review and reaction following the big West Virginia win. But the West Virginia players of the week following that win offensive lineman of the week, Zach Frazier, Special Teams Player of the Week, Malachi Ruffin. Defensive Player of the Week, Beanie Bishop. Offensive Player of the Week, C.J. Donaldson. The Juice Squad Award goes to Nick Gray. Blue Collar Award goes to Doug Nestor on the offensive side. Blue Collar Award on the defensive side goes to Fator Mamoba. Scout Team Offensive Player of the Week, Charlie Katarinchik. Scout Team Defensive Player of the Week, Corey McIntyre. And Scout Team Special Teams Player of the Week, Colin McBee. So having said that, gentlemen, those are the players of the week from the university side. But after this big backyard brawl win that was so important for this staff, this team, and this fan base, who impressed you the most? It can be someone on offense, someone on defense, anybody you like. Who are you giving the player of the game to in this one, Steven? Oh, man, I was hoping he was going to go with you guys first. But I'll go first. Uh I've went back and forth between a few guys. Uh, I feel like you guys will choose the other two that I went back and forth between. Uh, so I'm not going to mention them, but I'm going to go with Aubrey Burks, man. I think that, uh, you know, for what we mentioned earlier, being able to bounce back after the Penn State game, the way that he, you know, gave up that big play, um, and to to get what I consider to be the, the momentum flop in the entire football game. Um, I think that was a huge interception and one that not only he needed, but our entire defense needed and our entire team needed. So I think that uh, he deserves a good player of the game for that. Love it. Love the shout out of Aubrey Burks. You know, he's someone that had a high praise throughout the offseason, and some people had been questioning that after a couple of things they'd seen through the first two games. So I love to see him bounce back, quiet those naysayers, and show why he's a player that has been so highly praised and will continue to be because he's going to continue to put on great performances like he did in the backyard brawl. Great pick for player of the game. Brad, where are you going with your pick for player of the game? Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm going to go with my boy Trey Latham. I think the guy led us in tackles. He just seemed to be in on every play. Um, I think he's a big part of why Pitt can get the run defense going. And like I said, I – He's fine under the radar right now, and that's barely, and it's still just underestimated him. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. It is not one of the two guys I thought you was going to go with. <laughs> I didn't either. I didn't either. I mean, the low-hanging fruit is obviously C.J. Donaldson, so I should probably go there. But, um, you know, 
let's not. I'm going to not be obvious. I'm going to give mine to the West Virginia tight ends, Cole Taylor and Traylon Davis. We talked about Cole Taylor's, you know, great performance in the passing game, getting the lone receiving touchdown for the Mountaineers. But I thought a lot of the play designs involved those guys. They were swinging across the formations. They were leading plays on, you know, stretch outside zone plays. You know, power plays off tackle. They were, you know sweeping across on the inside zone splits still and then of course being involved in the rpo game i really liked what i saw from both of those guys i think they were both highly rated uh from pff this week as well and rightfully so so although cj donaldson deserves player of the game and of course the team gives it to him and he's the obvious pick that any one of us three could take i like all three of us kind of going a different direction and going a bit more obscure so uh, i'm going to go tight ends but still got to shout out cj donaldson for putting the team on his back after the injury to garrett green but uh the west virginia tight ends i think are going to be weapons this season so i'm going there for player of the game i like that i consider cole taylor from mine too but i also you know i don't want to be remiss about N- missing nico either i think he deserves some some time and some mention yeah. in that slot as well i know he only threw th- nine passes but the game was very well facilitated by my guy. That's a great way to put it, facilitating the game there. And, you know, like I said earlier, I think he's a winner. That's one of the best things you can say about him, one of his best traits, and hopefully he continues to be that for West Virginia moving forward. But having said that, guys, I think I've covered pretty much everything that I wanted to get to here. Is there anything that we left out that you guys wanted to discuss or bring up here at the end before we close out this episode of the CRW podcast? Uh, There was one thing I wanted to mention. Um, eat shit pit baby hey there you go go. that's how you do it that's how you close it out hey thanks for coming guys love seeing you guys head back up i-79 with a big l in tow uh we'll be able to do it again here in a few years and we're looking forward to that as well so it's a great atmosphere in morgantown we loved it hope you guys did um west virginia two and one in 2023 now conference play begins and we're going to get into the nitty gritty and hopefully continue to see more west virginia football success but we're looking forward to talking about the start of conference play and this upcoming texas tech game so be on the lookout for our texas tech preview and predictions podcast releasing later this week and of course Tune into the YouTube channel as well, where we'll have the Q&A stream where you guys can drop your predictions for the game as well following the release of our podcast episode. So that's just a preview of what's coming from us later this week, and there will be plenty of Mountaineer sports content coming from the CRW as the season progresses. Great win in the backyard brawl. We're super excited about it. Know you guys are as well. Hopefully it's just the start of something awesome and West Virginia is able to carry this momentum forward into a very successful 2023 season. Either way, we'll be here to talk about it with you all along the way as it progresses. For my co-hosts, Stephen and Bradley, as always, I'm Jordan Cruz. And until next time, let's go Mountaineers. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those...